The poem that we're doing in this tutorial is Lost or Found World by the South African poet Mongane Wale Siroti. I'll start this tutorial by reading the poem to you and just explaining it briefly. Then we'll look at some of the themes, the overall ideas and the style of the poem so that it will help you to understand it as we go through it stanza by stanza and unpack some of the details. Lost or Found World Skies of truth are now scenes at the mercy of my curtain eyes. I wink often, more often, to draw the curtains, to cut and forget the skies. The sea of identity is tears, a too salty expression bleeding my blue veins, that's my pen, on the loose sand that shall sip and the wind that shall help cover it from the needy arteries. Mountains of hope are flowers, passes attracting cars like bees for the previous modern honey. This is money. This modern madness snaps flowers from their stems, leaves dry, dead bodies walking up the street. Old wishes is present deeds, bright with blinding for old, dark with wonder for the new. That's where we are, lost or found world. Right, so if you're like me, the first time I read this poem, I had no idea what this guy was going on about. But don't worry, you're going to understand it by the end of this tutorial. Briefly, what's happening in this poem is that you've got a poet who remains quite vague in terms of who he is, looking out at um, something, the skies of truth, he talks about it, and not really liking what he sees. He starts to talk about, in the second stanza, how difficult it is to regain his identity through, in some part, through writing. And he then moves on to talk about the the hope that drives people and the thing that drives them to seek for different things except that what they're looking for is not good for them it leaves them empty and without identity and he ends the poem where he talks about old wishes and and present deeds by examining the world that we find ourselves in right now today and leaving us with the question of of what we've lost and what we found that probably still doesn't make a lot of sense to you. So, so let's look at some of the, the more detailed aspects of the poem. First of all, um, Mongane Wale Siroti is a black man, obviously, who lived in South Africa during the apartheid regime. He is still alive, actually, but he was alive during the apartheid regime too. And so you're going to find some reference to apartheid and to the impact that apartheid had on him as a person and on his people, the black people. But it also has far more broader themes. So some of the overall ideas you're going to encounter relate to the style of this poem. It's a, a difficult style to grasp because it's a, a vague, dreamy, conceptual, philosophical style. And none of the descriptions is very clear, which I realize makes it a little bit harder. But it also makes it easier because there's a lot of ambiguity in the poem. This is deliberate. He's created the ambiguity on purpose because he wants to leave you, the reader, questioning what you believe in and he wants to leave leave you to create your own answers about the things that he's talking about and we'll we'll get to what he's talking about because that's what's contained in the themes and the themes again are very broad we've got big philosophical themes like hope or lack of hope and progress and and moving forward and truth and how and and what one does with you know, what one does to progress and to move forward and whether one is being true to oneself, whether one is being authentic to one's identity. And part of this might relate to the ability to express oneself personally. So let's look at some of those themes. First of all, the theme of identity is expressed um, primarily through the reference to apartheid and how apartheid deprived people of their identity. But you'll find that there's also some reference to identity through personal expression and whether it's possible to express oneself and still succeed uh, because um, sometimes that success doesn't always, sometimes personal success and the expression of personal identity are not necessarily the same thing. We'll, we'll see that. We're also going to see him refer to this idea of hope, the hope that maybe drove people forward during the apartheid times, but also the hope that drives us forward. This hope is expressed primarily through natural metaphors. You're going to see them in the poem. But he talks about the hope being destroyed by something that he calls the modern madness. 
And that modern madness breaks these these things that he calls the flower of hope. It snaps them. And the modern madness that he's referring to here is capitalism. So he's talking about money and the pursuit of money and how that resonates differently with old people and with young people. The hopes that old people had uh, a while ago and the actions that young people take now uh, might not necessarily add up to um, a success and identity. So take a look at all of those. And now we're going to move on to the, the specific stanzas of each poem. First of all, let's look at the title. The title, usually, when you, when you encounter the phrase lost and found, you normally find it says lost and found. So you might find at the airport, you know, lost and found, property that's, you know, lost property, and then it's found. There's an element of hope in that. Something was lost, and then it is found. But this title deliberately creates ambiguity because it can only be one or the other. It is either lost or found. That leaves us with the question of which is it? Is it lost or has it been found? Is it still lost? That is the way that the author creates ambiguity here, that the poet creates ambiguity. And there's a couple of other things that we're not so sure about. Which world is he talking about? Is it our world? Is it a, is it a past world? What aspect of the world is it? Is it all of those things that he, that he talks about in the themes, the idea of hope or money or identity? So it could be any of those things. But we've got to remember that primarily we're looking at this idea that something has been lost, possibly at the expense of that which has been found. And the way that you interpret the title might also influence the way that you possibly understand the poem. Are you still with me? I hope so. Okay, let's move on to the first stanza. The first stanza is an objective, a, a, a sort of objective one. And I'm, I'm talking about it objectively now because the second stanza is going to be a little bit more subjective. So it's objective in terms of the fact that you've got a person, a, a vague person, who's looking out at a scene and he's talking about the fact that he wishes that he could maybe not see what he's seeing. Now, the, the first stanza is important because what it does is it kind of sit, sets things up in a very dreamlike tone. We'll come back to the words now. But although it's being described from the speaker's perspective, we don't actually know who the speaker is. And we don't have a lot of detail about it. So because there's no clear contextual clues about the speaker, like there's no indication of time or place or gender or race or any of those things, because this is a very vague speaker, that deliberately creates the idea that the ideas that this person is talking about could be universally applicable. The speaker could be anybody. So again, although the poem is, we know who wrote the poem and when he wrote it, this poet is creating a very broad frame of reference. The skies of truth are now scenes. That is a metaphor. It's a direct metaphor. The skies of truth are scenes which are at the mercy of his eyes, his curtain eyes. Let's just unpack that a little bit. If he closes his eyes, it's the same as closing a curtain. So the skies which he's looking at can be closed by him closing his eyes. This could allude to, if you look at the word scenes, this could allude to the fact that the skies are like a scene in a play, and when the curtains close, that's the end of that scene. Or... The, the, the poet could be looking out at the sky and like, let's say, looking through a window and he could close the curtains on the window and that would shut out the sky. Now, all the time that you're thinking of this metaphor of the sky being closed out by curtains, what kind of sky is it? It's the sky of truth. So it's the truth that this person is seeing, but he doesn't want to see the truth because what is he doing? He's winking. He's, he's blinking, he's closing his eyes, and, and, and he's doing it often and more often. Why is he blinking all of the time? Why are these eyes, which are curtain eyes, trying to shut out the scene? It, he doesn't tell us. Is it because he doesn't believe what he's seeing? Is it because he's trying to forget? He seems to imply that he is trying to forget, because look at what he's doing. He says, I wink often, more often, to draw the curtains, to cut and forget the skies. Drawing means to close. He wants to close those curtains. He wants to block out this world. If he cuts it, 
Is he cutting it away? He wants to limit his view. He wants to restrict how much of the skies he has to see. Oh, sorry about those typos there. I'll go back and fix those chaps. He wants to forget them. So this, these skies that he sees are things that are at the mercy of his eyes and he wants to close his eyes and just not see them. This seems to imply that what he's seeing is not something that he wants to see. This truth that he's seeing is not a truth that is comfortable for him. He wishes he didn't have to see it. Let's move on to the second stanza. Now, before we look at this stanza in detail, I want you to just take note of the fact that this second stanza starts with a metaphor just the same as the first stanza started. Let's look at the structure of the poem again. Although this poem doesn't have any rhyme scheme or any real regularity in the structure, the one thing that stays constant throughout is that each stanza starts with a metaphor. Look at them. The skies of truth are now scenes. There's your first metaphor. The sea of identity is tears. Mountains of hope are flowers. Old wishes are present deeds. Each stanza starts with a new metaphor. So let's go back to the second stanza. The sea of identity is tears. Now that's not a very hopeful way to start a stanza. We started by talking about tears. But what we've got in this first stanza is that we move away from a quite um, external, objective view of a particular scene, the, the sky of truth, to something more personal and more subjective. Namely, this the, the question of identity. Identity is a very personal thing. And in this case, identity is tears. Now, tears are something that, even if you close your eyes, are still in your eyes. So although in the first stanza we had this idea that he could close his eyes and shut off what he was seeing, in the second stanza, if he's got tears in his eyes, those tears still stay there. They don't go away. So this, this, this implies that he can't escape this thing. So that's the first aspect. And then the identity is tears. Now, it's not just one identity. It's a sea of identity. That seems to suggest that he's talking not just about himself, but maybe more people. Maybe all of the people that were living under apartheid, which deprived them of their individuality and their identity. Or maybe this identity is tears because these are the tears of, of everything that's been lost. Or identity is being identified with sadness. So identity is inextricably linked with a sense of sadness. Maybe when your identity, when who you are, is so problematic, you know, if it's a thing like race and it's inescapable and race results in you being oppressed, then your identity is the source of your sadness. What he does to deal with this is that he turns to writing to try and express himself. He tries to regain his sense of identity by bleeding his veins. Um, I'm bleeding my blue veins. That's my pen. The bleeding his veins is, is referring to him pouring out his feelings. Um, and the blue is the ink of his pen. But the problem here is that he's not really succeeding in creating anything meaningful. The, him bleeding out his veins is useless because look at what he's bleeding it out onto. He's writing onto loose sand. And the sand sips, it drinks up, it sucks up the blood that he's using to write his identity. And because he's writing on sand, the wind can come and blow that identity away. So although he is trying to express himself, this expression seems useless. It'll, it'll disappear, it'll sink into the sand and it'll get blown away. It's a very hopeless tone. And not only that, but he's bleeding his veins from the needy artery. So look at the third line and the last line of that stanza. I'm bleeding my blue veins from my arteries. It's almost like in writing, he is um, like bleeding himself dry and, he, and his arteries need the blood. He needs something, but it's being wasted. Um, that that essence of who he is, that the, the heart of who he is, is, is just being bled away. 
Um, I'll come back to this a little bit later. So hold on to this idea of writing and about personal expression and identity because we're going to we're going to come back to this a little bit later. So here we've got this idea that he's trying to regain some sort of identity through writing, but there's a sense of hopelessness in his ability to do that. Now we move into a much broader stanza, the third stanza. Now we've gone from him personally to something much bigger. Mountains of hope are flowers. Okay, now what the hell? <laughs> Sorry, Jeffs, but this is so vague. So let's just let's just get more specific. In this particular metaphor, the one that this stanza starts with, flowers are the people in society who have to travel over the mountains, which on the other side of the mountains is some sense of hope. So the flowers here are the people in society who have to travel over the mountain passes to get to where they can make some money. Let's let's look at the first three lines of this. Again, mountains of hope are flowers. They are passes attracting cars like bees for the previous modern honey. This is money. Okay, this is an entire stanza that is talking about um, the idea of people moving towards cities like bees are attracted to flowers because it is the cities in which they make their money. Okay, let me repeat that. People are like, people are, are moving out of their rural areas towards cities in order to make money. Now, again, this is kind of vague and ambiguous because the mountains can mean a number of things and the passes can mean a number of things and the honey is also a number of different things. So let's look at the, the different possible meanings of these things. The mountains could be seen as obstacles to the things that allow them to make money. So they have to move over the mountains to get to where they can make money. In order to get over the mountain, what do they have to move over? A pass, a mountain pass. So the pass, on the one hand, could be the thing that enables them to get over the mountain. But on the other hand, a pass is also, in this poem, possibly a reference to the pass books that were required during apartheid, during the time that the pass laws were in place. Now, right up until the early 1980s, um, black people in South Africa could not move freely. They always had to have their pass book with them. And if they, if they were not able to produce their pass book, they were arrested. So just look at this idea of a passbook. A passbook is proof of your identity. And without proof of your identity, you can't move freely. So look back at that idea of identity in the previous stanza and how he's trying to regain some identity. But that proof of identity in this stanza could actually be something that restricts movement, that prevents a person from being able to make money. So that's that first that's the first metaphor that we're looking at over there. Now let's move on. There, the passes are attracting cars like bees because the bees want to go and get honey, but not just any honey, modern honey. This is modern madness. So look at the idea here. You've got modern honey and modern madness happening here. Um, the repetition of modern seems to imply that this was not something that existed previously. And the modern madness that he's talking about here is actually capitalism. It's the striving to make more money. Because what does it do? This modern madness snaps flowers from their stems and it leaves dry dead bodies walking up the street. Now, if you were to look at the fact that the, the travel that he could be referring to is actually an allegory of um, the travel that was required during the apartheid era to move from the, the, the not the townships, the homelands into the cities. Then he's referring to migrant labor and he's talking about the fact that the migrant labor is what destroys these flowers, it's what, break, it's what breaks them. You have to move from your family, you've got to, the, the workers had to be separated from, from their families in order to go into the cities and make money. But that separation left them like dry, dead bodies. Look at the way the imagery changes. You have that, you have all of the natural imagery from the, from the first 
three lines, the bees, the flowers, the honey, and it's been replaced with imagery of city streets. They just walk up the street like dry, dead bodies. They've been sucked dry. Um, the, this implies that the people that have sought money might have lost something of themselves. They might have they might have lost their souls in the pursuit of money. Now, while we're here, let me go back to what I talked about in the second stanza with him talking about writing and authenticity. You might also be able to draw meaning, a possible meaning from this in the sense that an attempt to be authentic might not necessarily be financially rewarding. And so you might forsake personal or artistic expression for something more financially lucrative. And that could also leave you dried up with soulless, just kind of pursuing money, pursuing riches at the expense of yourself, at the expense of the thing that makes you who you are. So can you start to see that we're talking here about something a little bit more broad than just apartheid and just the movement of people in apartheid and, and, and identity during apartheid? Although that is the basis for the poem, this poem can also be made to extend to something far greater. Right. Let's end this final stanza. Now we end with him saying that old wishes is present deeds. Now the, the reason for that, that, um, uh, verb there not being are old wishes is present deeds it's almost like all the old wishes collectively is one thing and all of the present deeds are another thing now what are these old wishes the old wishes are the wishes that the people had the older people had the hopes that they had they had hopes for something brighter for something better but that hope was so bright that it blinded them the the old wishes are bright with blinding for old. Do you see that? Look at all of the things that relate to the old people. And let's look at the contrast here between what is bright and what is dark. Old is linked to bright and new is linked to dark. So the old wishes were the hopes that they had that were so bright that it blinded them just as much as the, the promise of the modern honey blinds the people to the true nature of what it is that they want. Now this bright, the brightness is contrasted with dark, darkness, which is actually the reality that the travelers of the, of the second stanza would have encountered. Um, it's full of wonder, this new world, this, this found world possibly, and yet it drains them of their lives like the flower was drained in the previous stanza. So look at the contrast there. Look at, the, look at the, the juxtaposition of old and new and bright and dark. That's a deliberate parallel construction. Old, old wishes is present deeds. Bright is the older, but they were blinded by the bright. And they, the new, the young people are dark with wonder for this new found world. What have the old lost? Have they lost those hopes? Or is it the hopes that cause the younger, newer people to pursue something that, that when they find actually leaves them in the dark. Oh my gosh, can, can you get your head around that? But that's where we are. That's how he ends it. He says that is where we are right now in this lost or found world. This is our current situation. We are faced then, we, everybody, with a decision of either staying in a world without money, possibly in a world without work. So possibly that world that he talked about in the second stanza, the world that they had to leave behind, but that is the world that has been lost. Or we can be lured into this world of wonder, of dark wonder, this found world, but it is also a place filled with dry, dead bodies walking up the city streets. It sounds like a zombie apocalypse, doesn't it? So the traveler, the person who sort of had to pass over the mountains, the obstacles, is left in a, in a hopeless situation. Neither of these options is, is a very satisfactory option. And it sort of, sort of leaves us without any real answer or context. Although we know who Soroti was, we know that he was in exile and we know that he lived during apartheid. This poem is not necessarily about apartheid. It could be about any of the things that draws people away from, from their truth, from their identity. That's why in the first stanza, 
he's talking about the present tense. He's looking at something right now. Although he refers to apartheid being something that deprives people of identity at that time, he's talking about now. Where are we? Where are we now? What is it that we don't want to see? So this poem does talk about things like um, migrant labor and about identity and how that identity can be the source of, of so much difficulty. But it is also possible that we can extend the ideas of this poem because of the deliberate ambiguity that the poet created to, to much broader concepts. This world that we're talking about, that could be any world. We left with the question as to whether this is actually a South African problem or whether it's a, a, a global one. And we are left asking ourselves, what is it that we lost and what have we found? And have we found things at the expense of those things that we lose? So that's it. That's the entire poem. I hope that you understand that a little bit better. If you've got any questions, you know where to find me. And thanks for watching.